Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope you had a good lunch. We'll now be having a panel discussion on the role of real-time locating systems for improving hospital workflows. When we talk about patient care in general, we usually talk about the clinical aspects and how that has impact on the quality of treatment. However, when it comes to a hospital, you'll be amazed by the number of things that actually go on in the background, which support various processes in the hospital. In other words, if you don't have the operational aspects properly prepared, the clinical processes which depend on the operation, uh, operational aspects will actually come crumbling down. With us here today in the studio are four leading experts from four different hospitals who have extensive experience, I must say, on optimizing various uh, hospital workflows, ranging from the emergency department to complete hospital-wide deployments. First, we have Dr. Von Wagner. Uh, he is the chief medical officer, uh, chief medical informatics officer, sorry, and the head of the executive department for medical IT systems and digitization at Frankfurt University Hospital, which was established in 2019. Uh, Dr. Von Wagner has medical responsibility for standardization in hospital information systems and the structuring of requirements for these, as well as the assessment of digital medical innovations and is responsible for the digital strategy of the University of Medicine together with the Chief Information Officer. After completing his studies in 2000, he worked at the University Hospitals in Frankfurt and Homburg Saar. And after returning to the University Hospital Frankfurt in 2007 and graduating as a specialist, he began to set up a patient management uh, clinic. From 2014 to 2018, he was medical director of the executive department, central patient management, and as a key user for the medical information systems, was already involved in significantly improving the implementation of central processes and the digitization of the hospital. He works as a senior physio physician in gastroenterology. Uh, in the context of the corona pandemic, Dr. Von Wagner is a member of the coordinating hospital staff for the care area at the hospital Frank, uh, at the University Hospital and is also project manager uh, over there. Next, we have uh, Dr. Gerritian Nordegraf. He's a consultant anesthesiologist at the Elizabeth Twaysteden Hospital in Tilburg. He is chair of the residency program, a lieutenant colonel in the Dutch Medical Corp with multiple tours to multinational hospitals in international conflict areas a leading educator and a long-term research consultant with Philips. His focus has been in modeling and dynamics of the circulation and clinically on safety and workflow management and monitoring. He was originally trained in the US. He matriculated to the Netherlands uh, and Belgium with a specialty in training in anesthesiology and later received his PhD in Nijmegen. He is past lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania he is active within the Dutch Society of Anesthesiology as a member of the executive board for the residency program and as a member of the national registry panel, as well as member of focus area committees such as emergency medicine. In 2019, he was elevated by the mandate from the King of the Netherlands to officer uh, in the order of Orania Nassau for exemplary service in innovation and education in medicine. We also have Professor Radon uh, from the University of Valencia, head of the Institute of Medicine of the Un Hospital Clinico of Valencia, and of the Cardiovascular and Renal Research Group in Cleva. He's also the scientific director uh, of the Research Institute of Incliva, um, past president of the European Society of Hypertension, Dr. Honoraris Causa by the Carol Davlila University of Bucharest, and author of more than 600 papers. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Job Gutling. Job has been a medical physicist in OLVG Hospital in Amsterdam since 2010. He has an MBA degree from Nienrod Business University. His passion is introducing new technology in the healthcare sector. Well, welcome all uh, to this session. I'm glad to have you here on board. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah, it's, I think, uh, all of you here today have been deeply involved in multiple RTLS pilots, right? Uh, some of you are looking at specific care pathways, um, 
specific care pathways within the hospital itself, within the emergency department, like we saw in pilots today, focusing on stroke and on, on sepsis. And there are other, and you, for example, you are looking at asset management hospital wide. We also have uh, Dr. Von Wagner, who's involved in, uh, yeah, uh, basically looking at optimization of workflows in the emergency department. Um, one of the reasons why we are having this panel discussion today is just to see what is it, what kind of messages can we give to hospitals in the future who would like to follow in your footsteps um, and see, you know, um, how do you actually replicate these things in, in other hospitals? So I'd like to gather some feedback initially uh, because, you know, if I look at uh, you, Dr. Von Wagner, you have um, actually uh, implemented a real uh, deployment in your hospital. It's working at the moment. Um, I would like to know if you can tell us a bit about why did you think of having such a system in the first place? What were some of the pains and challenges that you were facing um, that made you think, you know, this is something that we really need for the hospital? I think we have to, to talk about uh, two aspects. The first aspect was that we uh, tried to um, combine data from different sources and to take a look more on the processes and not anymore just on the medical data as in most of the, um, in most of the projects we um, did in the, in the uh, past. So we were interested in a very granular analysis of real processes, not just a discussion of theoretical processes. And the reason for this typical project was that for an emergency department in which you have a high number of patients and already small differences in the time periods make in summary a large difference for the the whole department or uh, at, at the end uh, even for the whole hospital, you need very accurate uh, analysis of the timestamps, accurate time points and uh, in, uh, in past um, analysis, for instance, and I mentioned this in my presentation, we had to realize that the dismission time in the whole hospital, not just in the emergency department, is um, far away from the real time of the uh, patient departure. Usually you can um, uh, be informed about the time of the change between two shifts, because at the end of a shift, this is the typical time for documentation by the nurses and they usually document the departure time and then all the patients are leaving at 2, 2 p.m. In reality, the patients left the hospital during the whole um, day. So um, knowing this, we were looking for other sources, data sources, and we were looking for a platform where we can combine data from the EHR, which are very accurate, together with other data uh, measured by that without any further burden on the workload of the staff. Indeed, indeed. And, and you're mentioning data accuracy. I mean, we also saw that in our various uh, presentations, presentations today, today, right? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nodograf and Dr. Radon also, also in both your pilots, there were data accuracy issues. But I think, but data accuracy is of course one aspect. You can do retrospective analysis and find that uh, out and identify those inaccuracies. Mm -hmm. But um, also, Dr. Von Wagner, I was thinking from a real-time perspective, uh, you also have a dashboard um, in the emergency department, isn't it, which actually shows you how, um, yeah, where, where the uh, patients are in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a few words on how you think that has, uh, why did you actually think that you needed a solution like that? Um, why did you need to this, see things in real time on a dashboard? This was even the more important reason for implementing the system. The, the, the other part is of uh, high interest to, 
but um, to improve the day-to-day -day practice in the ED was the primary topic. And uh, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, we were interested to bring uh, the, the relevant data on an aggregated platform dashboard where the, uh, with which the um, responsible physician and the responsible nurse can get an overview with just one view about the situation of the processes in the ED as well as on the process uh, of uh, any singular patient. So we combined now data from the EHR like uh, how many um, examinations were ordered, how many results did we already get back, is the um, diagnostic completed for this patient, is the report already completed, is the patient uh, uh, or has the patient already been in the triage, if, uh, uh, what color of triage the patient has. So to combine these very important data, and therefore it was so important that we brought in the beginning all the relevant people together, so discussing, discussing what five relevant features do you need, what topics do we want to see, really, really important. And by doing that, you had to realize these data come from totally different sources. And so we had to bring them together in one dashboard. And this was a primary topic. And we already uh, completed this. This is already running. For, for instance, just knowing is the patient still physically in the radiology department or is the patient already back or is the patient not even in the radiology. So you get an idea, what can I do now? What is the next step I can do for this patient? Or do I have time for other patients? Yeah, indeed. So it's really like, you know, if you look at things from um, the control tower in an airport, for example, you, you, have, um, you, you have a view on how planes are coming in, how planes are going out. And without that, you simply can't operate it, right? So I, I think this is exactly the same thing where you see uh, patients coming into the system, you have a live dashboard of where exactly they are in the care pathway, and um, yeah, then, then you can see where bottlenecks also form. Um, there was an interesting point that Dr. Von Wagner mentioned about data integration, and I know that uh, looking at assets as well, uh, you have been OLVG hospital, um, you of course have a whole hospital-wide deployment also of uh, performance flow, and yeah. using the real-time system you can actually locate where assets are. Um, but the, you also had to integrate data there, isn't it, from the computer-managed uh, maintenance yeah. system. Could you give us some examples of what, why did you do that data integration? What benefits did you get from it? And so, so a little bit back to the, where we started. The, the problem that I faced when I was a team leader for the, for the med te medical technology department, um, we had syringe pumps which are you know, the pumps that uh, basically in every patient room there is one. In our hospital there were about 500, or at least the system showed that there was supposed to be 500. And when I looked at the maintenance reports, I saw that they were only doing maintenance of 400. So it was like, where are the other 100 pumps? No one knew. Mm -hmm. And when I was a teenager, I worked at the grocery store, and every, uh, every year, or actually twice a year, we had what they called a balance day. So then we would count everything that was in the, in the supermarket. You know, even a cucumber, 50 cents, it was important that we knew how many there were. Yeah. And in the hospital, we have 50 million worth of, of medical devices and we just misplaced, in this case, only the syringe pumps. It was over one, 150K uh, worth of assets that were just gone. And it turned out that, um, you know, in our case, um, in the emergency department, uh, they were given to the ambulance uh, people, they drove off with the patient, and the pump never returned. Wow. Okay. But we just didn't know. Yeah. So that was one of my first encounters uh, as a team leader. I was responsible for uh, maintenance costs, and I was like, where are, where's the stuff? And is that what triggered you then to yeah. go in this direction? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And my wife is a doctor, and she also came home with stories that she had to use an ultrasound machine. And there were two uh, departments, the cardiothoracic uh, department and the pulmonology department where she was working. And uh, the ultrasound machine could be in either of those. Yeah. Or it could be down at the emergency department. 
And that was with a bad elevator connection that we had. It was yeah. 25 minutes so that's of quite time. a treasure hunt that you yeah. need to go for. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and for those things. are a couple of, of those nuggets that I found. Like, okay, if this is what I'm hearing and I'm only hearing a small part, then the problem must be huge. Mm -hmm. So then mm -hmm. I dove into it and, you know, indeed collecting all kinds of, of different data. So at first in the small uh, setting and then hospital wide. Um, but of course, it's very expensive to cover the whole hospital with Absolutely. all kinds of sensors. Absolutely. So you have to do a smart, uh, smart integration. So we used a combination of infrared that's very location specific. And yeah, basically it's yes or no. You're, you're sure that it's in the room or not. Uh, and Wi-Fi, which is a technology that basically produces an area uh, where uh, the asset might be. Um, yeah, and that of course gives you coverage in the entire hospital. Correct, right? because so the Wi-Fi was already there, so we only had to adjust it uh, to make it suitable for our needs. Yeah, so so I think we are looking at different use cases. On the one hand, we have Dr. Von Wagner's use case where you have very high resolution information, which is just looking at the emergency department, but it's really looking at things from a completely operational perspective and location perspective. Where is the patient? Uh, how long are they taking in uh, various yeah. parts of the process? And you get this information in real time. Um, and then in your case, you're looking at the assets which support all the medical stuff. That's not only looking at a specific department. Okay, in certain cases, you yeah. are looking at specific department, like in the mother and child, uh, you had high resolution information, but uh, assets don't only stay within a department, they go across the hospital. They're shared resources, so yeah. you need to track them all across. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's where you go into this enterprise-wide deployment. Um, but then we've also taken a slightly different approach or different focus in the big Metalytics project where we are looking at specific care mm -hmm. pathways. So, um, yeah, maybe, uh, Dr. Radon, if you could just well, guide us through wh why did you think that this is actually needed? Why, why is there a need to retrospectively anal analyze the data of sepsis patients in their uh, workflows? I think that, uh, as has been commented, when the retrospective information that you get, you identify where are the problems, and then you need uh, to try to present to the team and then to try to solve. Because usually this is not an, in one emergency department. Sometimes the most important in these cases and in these actions are not the physicians, are not the nurses, are sometimes the auxiliary personnel that is moving people. And then that there are sometimes difficulties because there is usually overflow in the emergency departments. And uh, there is concentrate in, in some period of time that if you cover, if you calculate it 24 hours, that uh, this is not real because you have uh, some periods of time and you have the overflow. If uh, you have the possibility to have a dashboard such as commented or Warren, it's uh, important, a very important aid for the nurses and for the on uh, that uh, physicians too, because it is to help him what is happening in this moment and when need to act as soon as possible. After the triage that you select those some process that will be critical this, it is possible to follow carefully because initially if you receive a color of, uh, the, from the triage maybe can take action rapidly in this. Mm -hmm. But the follow-up of this, sometimes if the patients are asymptomatics, because if the patients is with dyspnea or so on, well, everybody take attention to them. Of but course. if the case of sepsis, really the patients are quiet. <laughs> I don't say anything. That's only the blood pressure is going down. And then, and the saturation of oxygen, but uh, not, symptom not symptoms. And this is even so, so, more so important. So then you're saying the system needs to then actually trigger somehow so that For the sure. patient actually gets. And, and there is another element that needs to be considered. The mean age of the people that go to the emergency room is increasing. And in increasing, some of them have disoriented that they are not able to ask for aid and so on. And then having a more close uh, 
attention about what and how the patient is, because this is the way to integrate, mm -hmm. not only where it's located. If it is uh, some alarm signs, and Indeed. when uh, the lab is coming data and so yeah, on. And, and, and I, I think, think that this is extremely useful for the people that work and for the patients because the attention for sure will be better. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's kind of what we saw also in Dr. Von Wagner's presentation yeah. earlier this morning where he was talking exactly about what you mentioned that real-time data is coming in, but it's not only about the location, right? You have all the other yeah, data and, that's and, coming and, in from the other medical devices. There is one thing that this morning was commented in one of the slides for Dr. Warren is to have information from the time that the ambulance pick up the patients to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. in our system is integrated, uh, primary and a hospital. Mm -hmm. All is integrated, the patient is with the same number, and uh, we use the same uh, MRI. And then it uh, even will be relevant in some occasions that uh, the ambulance sent an, uh, that signal to the hospital, mm -hmm. an alarm, that something with a real, real impact in the patients in bad conditions is coming there. Yeah. And this for stroke, this would, is would, absolutely... Would be, would be critical, I think, isn't <laughs> it? Uh, Dr. Nordograf, yes, speaking to, about stroke, maybe we can, we can switch to you. So you have data coming in from ambulances and uh, you have the real-time data coming in from the RTLS system and you use that to optimize the workflows uh, in, in real time. But I actually feel amazed that we talk about time critical patients right now and this is not there in hospitals all around, right? You don't see these sort of opt real time optimization systems to that extent. And what would be your thoughts on that? I mean, do you think this is something that's needed and how would they benefit from it? Well, the, I think the stroke pilot is different than, for example, the sepsis in that our patients are defined as being at risk even before they arrive. And we know when they arrive that we have 60 minutes and the clock is ticking, okay? The neurology workflow is very carefully thought out. It's a fine dance. But the only way to protect it from gradual degradation is to monitor it. Okay, so every step in that pathway should be repeated by all the professionals in more or less the same way. On a daily, evening, night basis, it shouldn't really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And we know that earlier treatment is better. Um, there is no real way to monitor that without a system like RTLS, okay? because the movements need to be observed in an unbiased fashion. We know that the EMR is used prospectively. We know there's a patient coming in. We can prepare orders, and that's already before the patient is there. Or if we forget, we can do it afterwards. Okay? So we need an independent source of high quality data. And by looking at a, a series of patients, you can see where bottlenecks are appearing. Okay? And you can use that to push your time frame back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I don't think there's another system readily available that can do that for you. So we defined, for example, the clinical investigation before the CT can be done as soon as a nurse, the resident neurology, and the patient are there. Are there, yeah. And Otherwise you have a bottleneck. Exactly. Yeah. And, okay, the procedure describes that the professionals will be in the reception room mm -hmm. before the patient arrives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Even, even the CT technicians are there before the patient arrives, although we now know that it takes about 10, maybe 15 minutes before he's ready for the CT. Mm -hmm. okay? But they're there because if it goes quickly, you don't want to wait. And that kind of multidisciplinary collaboration is, is great, and you can visualize it using RTLS. It's not in the EMR. Yeah, of course. And because the only you, other option is to get somebody to you, stand there and write it out for you. You need real-time coordination as such, exactly. right? Exactly. Using this. So the dance needs to be done. 
Um, but you need somebody to keep track of the time. Somebody has to pace. So essentially you're talking about a kind of timer which is running on the dashboard always in front of you. You know, I mean, you can't, you can't drive a car without a dashboard and you can't do management of stroke care I patients know. without I, a dashboard. I, I just means. heard in lunch in Cuba, you don't need a dashboard in your car because the basic pace is very slow. But <laughs> yes, you need to know what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. And if it has to be real time, I'm not sure, but you need to be able to aggregate data and see, are we gradually deviating from the pathway? Okay, not because people intend to, but simply because it's a rut. But, but if you now have this information in real time, um, you, you see that there is a bottleneck, right? So you have a timer, you see it's going in the red. Something needs to be done. Um, can you actually do something about it? Do you think that you have the strings, right strings to pull to bring it back into the green again to react immediately? Can you change behavior immediately? Is, is sure. that an option? Sure. I think that professionals in medicine are continuously busy with changing their behavior, mm -hmm. adapting to new procedures, um, finding better, quicker, safer ways of doing things. But we're professionals, we want to know why. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that and then we can do it, okay? And that the pathway is really well thought out. Um, it's not the pathway that's at issue, it's our professionals who are using the pathway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But can you give maybe an example, a couple of examples of specific things one would do when you see it going red? Um, ah, okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, we have an example of a patient who took a long time to get to the CT. Yeah. Okay. And when we dove into that case, we saw that um, a nurse in training had been involved in the clinical assessments in moving the patient from the stretcher onto the uh, CT table and had had trouble with getting IV access. 15 minutes worth of trouble getting IV access. Okay. Ah, that's a large percentage of those theoretically absolute yeah. 60 minutes. Yeah. Okay, so what is the learning? The learning is, yes, this can always happen. It can happen to anybody. Of course. But 15 minutes is too long. Um, there was supervision available. The nurse should have asked for help and somebody should have intervened and said, you know, this step is taking very long. Um, do we have to do this now or can we do the CT first? Because we need an IV access, yes we do, but perhaps after the CT is good too. Mm -hmm. so, so this is interesting because from the, data that you, from the data that you're gathering, you need to analyze that and basically have some kind of um, consultant who identifies these are the inefficiencies in your workflow and give recommendations on what can be done to improve uh, these things, right? Um, yeah. that, that, that's what you would want to do. Yeah, um, optimally you need somebody who's sitting there and observing, the eye in the sky. Mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. and RTLS is capable of uh, binding content with time, mm -hmm. time that progresses, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, much mm -hmm. better than the EMR is. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so, so I'm wondering for a similar case, you, you know, you're looking at the stroke care pathways and from Dr. Von Wagner's uh, perspective, um, could you give some examples when, when, since you have this real time dashboard, um, just like we heard Dr. Nordograph and what, what are the things that can be in, done in real time to optimize these workflows? What is your experience with using such a system? How do you think such a system can help you? What are the things that you can do? How do your staff actually use it to impact change immediately, right? And that's the reason why you have real-time information so that you can make change on the ground. Could you give some examples of how the system is used to do that? Um, currently, I, I, I think we have really two perspectives. We have the uh, per patient perspective, which is used just in time. <laughs> But this is more the perspective uh, uh, not to change pr processes like uh, 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 described before, but to really get an information very quickly uh, in a situation and without uh, opening other systems. 
And uh, on the other side, and this is the, the way we use it more at the moment, is that you get an overview uh, about groups of patients, departments, and uh, uh, current situations over, over more than one patient, so over the, the a period of time. And looking in a, in a kind of a time uh, line, is this changing? Uh, do we have uh, new bottlenecks leading to a change in, in, in a separate uh, uh, time periods in the process? This is more the way we are currently using the system. And also we are still in the phase of establishing or, or uh, completing optimal timestamps also in the EMR because um, a lot of the uh, questions we are asking can be uh, answered by the RTLS, but some of the questions, some of the time points like decision by the physician can't be done by the RTLS. So it's always the combination of both systems and we are still uh, in the period, in the phase to complete the whole processes with uh, the significant timestamps. Okay. Yeah. Thank you Thank for you. that, uh, Dr. Von Wagner. So I was thinking in terms of changes that you can make based on the data that's coming in. Um, Job, can you give your thoughts on, you know, uh, not only the real-time aspects, but the retrospective uh, insights that you get from the, the data? What are the changes that you can make in your hospital based on the insights uh, from the data? I would say the, the impact that a system like this could have on hospitals is almost infinite. Um, so I, start, I, I mentioned uh, where I started out, only looking at uh, the asset uh, part of things uh, and only on the, the technology side of things and not the clinical impact of it. So when I found out that uh, not only were we having trouble with misplacing expensive assets, we were also um, having trouble with people spending a lot of time searching for assets, then one and one became two or three. And you know, there, there was a, a viable business case to start um, uh, looking into this, uh, into this system. But then it turned out there were like 20 use cases that we came up with within a couple of weeks uh, from people who were also interested in uh, their specific problem being tackled by a similar uh, similar setup and in some, time, in some cases you had to tweak it a little bit but in most cases you could just use the what was already there and also improve their way of working so for instance um, everyone who has been, ever been to a hotel knows that there's a checkout time right so the checkout time may be 10 a.m 11 a.m and then the check-in time is in the afternoon typically and you could ask for early check-in or a late checkout but these times don't overlap because there has to be cleaning in between. So in a hospital, everyone uh, has to leave at some point. And so every admitted patient has to leave uh, and new patients have to be admitted. But it turns out that in our uh, case, uh, we just, um, uh, people came in at random times, mm -hmm. most of the time somewhere during the day uh, after a consultation. Um, but people were not uh, fired from the hospital early enough. So basically in the morning it was like, which capacity do we have? None, because everyone was still there. Yeah. And then during the day, 50 people left, but already we wanted to have room for 50 more people. So what did the hospital do? They just built 50 new, uh, 50 new beds, new capacity, which was totally unnecessary. And perhaps even worse, you know, with all that comes new equipment, new people of course the associated costs right? yeah associated cost and and i think that that is a very interesting point because if you look at it from the scope of uh, from the perspective of big analytics it's not just about um, what you see in the retrospective data but i think the next step a lot of people are talking about that is to go into the predictive analytics part and that's Absolutely. exactly where yeah. where you could potentially help so yeah. what would be your thoughts if you now combine ai with that where do you think AI could help um, with predicting some of the aspects that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, so I'm also very interested in the emergency department because that's a large flow of patients coming into the hospital. Um, and I, I once saw a graph which was really interesting. 
uh, which showed the, uh, I think, the admittance of patients, or at least people coming into the emergency department. And it turned out that you could actually really uh, predict uh, the unpredictable and all the other stuff that was the noise. So mm -hmm. it was completely the other way around as what you would expect. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in terms of capacity management, there's lots to be gained by, by using systems like uh, RTLS and incorporating the knowledge uh, into, your, into your processes. Mm -hmm. okay. For the ICU, I know that they now have decision support algorithms to define optimal moments for extubating a patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that you can predict if we do that early enough, then we can discharge that patient to a ward the next morning yeah. and plan that as opposed to becoming uh, reactive, so okay, now we need a new bed, um, which patient do we need to extubate? Uh, and for, for discharge, you could use such a program the day before, say, okay, yeah. are these people medically ready? Okay, so we're planning them for discharge, uh, except if something happens, yeah. but that, that, that makes what we like to think is total improvisation, makes it manageable. Yeah, yeah, and, and, th and that's a very interesting point because here you're giving a perfect example of combining the clinical data and making predictions and having that impact the operational part, yeah. right? So, so that, that's also very... Uh, people have said to me, like, the, what you're doing does not have to do anything with the clinical part, but I strongly disagree because, uh, as you mentioned in your introductory uh, words, the, the whole issue is that some of these... Um, supporting mechanisms are not working at all. Mm -hmm. So in our hospital there was a, a small department with people who were tasked to uh, transport beds from one department to the other. But they had nothing to do with, uh, uh, with the clinical departments themselves. They were a supportive organization. So they were also away from the daily practice and there was no one yelling in their ear like, okay, we need a bed right now. Now what they heard was a phone call or uh, an email like, okay, you have to bring a bed to this and this location. They were not in a hurry, yeah. but you know that the whole process in the ER or whatever other department may have completely been disrupted by their lack of, of any urgency. Yeah. Uh, that, that doesn't, uh, yeah, that didn't happen. So I think yeah. all of these things interact. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Professor... But we, uh, we identified clearly where it was the delays in um, the flow of the patients. And then we try to solve this because, uh, well, the causes will be multiple. But there are some times that uh, the patient is sent to radiology before to go to start treatment with observation. Mm -hmm. There's a few ones, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. The other ones is uh, this, that uh, the doctor prepare, do the time uh, standard, but nobody take the patients and transfer exactly. because when arrive to observation area is when they start the treatments and to do all the things. But, uh, well, uh, considering this, there is another thing that uh, we observe. We uh, design a pre-RTLS and during RTLS. Information coming from MRR and the RTLS and AMR. And then, just only that the people know that there are some kind of control, improve the time. Yeah. The times yeah. are reduced. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah, this I mean, is that, one, that, this that, is one that, phenomenon that, could, that, that, that definitely uh, could have that an need impact. That mentioned because it's, it is part yeah. of the life in the emergency department. But also, <laughs> one quick comment about the Incliva use case, because, uh, you know, today when you were presenting, you also saw the huge difference between the time when a physical, physically the patient moves out of the ED yeah, yeah. Um, and what is there in the EMR. There was quite a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you see that in multiple hospitals, right? That it happens because it's a very reactive process. Mm -hmm. where you just make a, once the patient is ready to be discharged, then you make a phone call and say, okay, I need a bed now. And then they start looking for a bed in the other parts yeah. of the hospital yes. and they say, okay, yeah, we have found a bed, uh, but it's not clean yet. 
it needs to be cleaned, and then somebody goes there, cleans yeah. it, and then, mm -hmm. oh, okay, but now it needs to be transported, so that also takes yeah. time, and all this accumulates. So I'm wondering, in, in Cleva's case, and I guess this could also apply in general, if you have predictive algorithms which actually already tell you in advance that, yeah, we expect in the next, I don't know, one hour or two mm -hmm. hours that this, well, this will be the number of beds that we probably yeah. would need, would, would mm -hmm. that help? Mm -hmm. Okay, as you say, that uh, you will see that the difference is approximately one hour in with, uh, from the time that yeah. is the time is stamped there and the real, the patients move. Well, but I think that this is not the relevant in this case because treatment has been started. What is more important is to start treatment because this is a, a, real, a real mess for the managers of the hospital to know at what time of the day and uh, when the rooms are available, when the rooms are clean, and so on. And this is always the big problem for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, if they have more precise information and algorithms, can improve. Then you can do that, yes. But, uh, well, at the time to solve. Well, one thing, the best and the first, is to know what happens. Of course. But at the time to take actions, there are much more things than not only those that can be predicted. Because sometimes what is necessary is to put more people cleaning. Of the course, rooms. of course. And the manager are not getting, but of course. Yeah, so I think but it's always about... of course, about if they have this, they can even calculate it, what can save. Absolutely. In terms of money, and if they provide one more people to do this, there, no. there are and certain so There are certain <laughs> strings you can pull and certain <laughs> strings you can't pull, right? Yeah, so yeah. you need to know That's which okay. ones yeah, you yeah. can no, no. pull. It's, uh, we... but, but in terms of uh, outcomes in uh, critical diseases, that uh, the most relevant is to start as soon as possible. And if it's necessary to transfer to a critical care unit, to do as soon as possible. Okay. Of course, yeah, this yeah. is yeah. Yeah. Whatever okay. the case, uh, even with the numbers of AMRI or if uh, the numbers with RTLS, the variability is really huge. You will see the average, but uh, if you see the, dis the distribution and the dispersion of the data, it's really huge. I think we've seen and that in then this many is of where our pilots. need yeah, to reinforce the messages to the and, team and, and the emergency and, and department is, in order and, and to And that be is essentially a quality issue as well, right? When yeah, you yeah, see there's sure. a big spread, you want to try yeah, and yeah. make it more predictable. Yeah, yeah. Spe speaking <laughs> of predictability, maybe some uh, concluding remarks, Dr. Von Wagner, from your perspective, what is your vision on how AI could help in the future of um, yeah, care pathways, predicting care pathways in the ED? Uh, what would be your thoughts on that? With this real-time information, what can you do with that? Planning in this uh, absolutely real time, but in the in a, in a uh, in a way that I'm informed, uh, analyzing the last days, I'm informed about the prediction of the next days. So, for instance, on Monday morning, when I have to plan the next days for the ED and uh, also for the hospital, is the situation um, or was the situation all over the weekend? in a case that we have, for instance, to reduce our elective patients. And so that we keep uh, uh, an, uh, uh, enough um, rest of capacity to solve or, or to, to treat all the patients uh, who will probably arrive during the next two days. And this is something where even experienced colleagues need more evidence for the discussions, and you already mentioned the managers you have to discuss with, but also you have to discuss with your colleagues. If you say, and we learned this from the pandemic, we have limited resources. Not every day everything is possible. So we need a kind of a, a, a view in the future to, to uh, adopt our longer plannings to the current situation. And for this, I think uh, uh, we need um, the evidence coming from these algorithms for our discussions with colleagues and, uh, and, and head of the departments about resources, 
so personal staff, as well as about uh, even uh, changes in the in the uh, uh, schedules for the next days, so that we still have capacity for further patients. Um, because if we do not have this, we get uh, the, uh, this has direct influence of our, of the quality of our. Uh, treatment, not for this patient at the moment, but for the next or the the one after. Yeah, yeah. Thank I think you. that uh, these issues that and predictive analytics for what can happen yep. in um, the same week during the week, or even to think what happens during the month, then combining information also about temperature, humidity, pollution, and so on. I think that this is uh, absolutely uh, that Im necessary to do in the next future and will be possible to do. Yeah. To remember that we ask for indeed something like indeed. this. Indeed, indeed, and, <laughs> and I think so. I think to, to summarize, if you if you look at the whole care pathway, you're talking about aggregation at different levels so yeah. uh, of data. So you, what can you do with predictions which are you know, in the order of minutes when we are talking about bed planning, for example, in, in a hospital, what's going to happen over the next hour. But uh, you can essentially use the same information to then aggregate that to the next level. What do we need on a weekly basis or monthly basis in terms of staff planning? Right, that, that's because yeah. you are, of course, limited with your staff, right? Yeah. So if, if I say, okay, I have this number of people today, I can't get any more stuff right now, so I can't. So there are only certain strings that you can pull, as I, as I said. But I think if you also do your planning well um, on the longer term, so on a weekly basis, monthly basis, uh, or per season, <coughs> and if you use that in combination with real-time planning, that's where uh, yeah the power of AI would really have an impact because then you're combining sure. yeah short-term views with long-term views and having an integrated view. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I would like to thank you all for that very uh, interesting discussion. Uh, thank you also, Dr. Von Wagner, for joining us uh, remotely on this uh, session. But yeah, it was very insightful. And uh, yeah, let's hope that uh, we see more hospitals coming on board. I mean, uh, yeah, we're, we're, okay. we're yeah. preaching about this, the possibilities of this the new technology, but I think people really need to try it out for themselves to see what an impact it can make, not only from a clinical perspective, but from an operational perspective, and not only from a department perspective, but also enterprise perspective. So there are really many different dimensions that people can benefit yeah. from. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, thank you all for this lovely session. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.